Hey guys, this is Coach Alan Baker and Coach Bob Berge. We are the Association Director and the Technical Director of Eric Paulson's Combat Submission Wrestling Association. Welcome to the CSW Podcast. Everybody, welcome back to the CSW podcast. It is July twelfth, two thousand sixteen. We have an awesome guest today. Um, we're both really excited. Oh Greg, yeah, it's fantastic. Greg you Nelson, guys are gonna love it. Greg Nelson. Just three days ago, uh, Brock Lesnar made his return to the UFC and was victorious. He got the win. Um, and Greg's going to tell us a little bit about that. Uh, he's uh, he's got some great behind the scenes stories. Uh, he's also got some uh, fighter training advice uh, or for training the pros. And then he's going to give us some personal workout advice. Uh, he's got great tips uh, on how he trains himself. Uh, he's 51 years old now, so we're all getting up there a little bit. <laughs> so he's trick. going to help us out. He's going to give us some advice on that. Um, and Alan's going to introduce us. If you don't know who this guy is, uh, I mean, he's he's a legend in our community uh so he's going to introduce him a little bit and then we're going to jump right into the content yeah and just uh i'm just going to mention a few things here about um aja and greg um if you ever do any type of search online for greg it's amazing what his story is and his background um he is the founder of the academy in brooklyn center minnesota he's a full instructor under guru dan and asanto a senior instructor under Grandmaster Chai Sarasut. He's a third degree black belt under Master Pedro Sauer. A full instructor, he is a super coach under Sensei Eric Paulson with the CSW Association. And as uh, Bob mentioned, just trained Brock, Brock Lesnar to a win in UFC 200. For a camp with that magnitude of guy, nobody knew where we were. We were like in the middle of nowhere. Up in a barn. Oh, you weren't at the academy training? No, because there's too many people here. Well, we came down, we, he came down to the academy to work in the octagon. And that was the day that we really broke him down. And, uh, you know, to build somebody up really to a high level, you got to break him down. And so that was the day we broke him down. He just got pickled and got broken down. And then he had to build himself back up. And then after that, nothing can be that bad again. So, was it mostly grappling or did you do any... No. Uh, it was striking. We did a lot of grappling because we had uh, we actually had Caprito in there because he's a you know two time absolute world champion. He's six foot whatever, super long and lanky, super durable, flexible, great great for the game. We had him and we had uh, Tony Nelson, who's two time NCAA national champ, three time finalist, four time All American, uh, also just a super tough wrestler. We had Cole Conrad. In there, who was the undefeated Bellator champion? Wow! And uh, also four-time All-American, fourth, second, first, first undefeated in his last 76 college matches as a heavyweight. Pat Barry was there, and Pat Barry was allowed to go off. Really? Try to knock him out. So it was like we said, "Hey, you got to get tested. You need your chin tested. You need your body tested." So hey, when it's time to go hard, you're going hard. Yeah, well, he had to because he's going against Mark Hunt. If you go against Mark Hunt, you're not. If you haven't been hit yet, it's going to be a wide, a rude awakening. Yeah. So we want to make sure that nothing was left, you know, untouched. Mm. But really, the biggest thing was we wanted to to make his stand-up game be almost unpredictable. That's why I said you. I want you to move chaotic in there. I don't want you to have any kind of rhythm. We're switching leads. We're going back and forth. We're going to jump in and fake. We're going to move back. And you, if you look at him like that second round, he was all over the place. Because if you give Mark Hunt a rhythm, he is going to find it and exploit it. So we said, don't give him any rhythm. And when you're going to shoot, explode through him like a like a running back. What was so your What was your advice uh, in between rounds? There was a, a little clip of you online that kind of went all over the place of you giving Brock advice. What'd you tell him in between rounds? I was kind of telling him at that time. I said to I work your jab, your long jab, fake a shot, hit your jab, fake the shot, keep fake and using your long 
chewed on him because yeah, now you want to get him a little bit so he, he's not able to plant, not able to set up his big overhand right lunging hook or uppercut because his rear uppercut, his rear overhand, and his lunging hook is what he knocks everybody out with. So I said, you know, you have arms that are for a six, eight, jab, fake, jab, jab, keep it out. And that whole second round, he was basically on his feet, moving around, did a couple shots. Mark did a great job of getting his ankles out of there and avoiding the takedown. And uh, there's a couple near misses. That I was just like, how did their arms not get tangled up? And they both threw like overhand rights at each other, and they just went. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no jab <laughs> overhands let's not trade with mark hunt <laughs> so is so, he is he uh do you shout a lot of stuff at him uh during the round or do you not do that or do you save that for no, in between i just talk to him like normal a lot of times when i'm in the corner first thing i usually do is have the guy breathe because they don't if they don't have oxygen they're not hearing you anyways mm -hmm. So a lot of times, if they're breathing fine, which he was, he was just like pretty calm. He wasn't like dying. He was just like breathing, but he wasn't like I've seen him like dying, right? Because we pushed him to the point of dying, like. Ugh. <laughs> so he was just like so that I could talk to him at that point, say okay, and he'd look right at you, shake his head, yeah, yeah. And then Marty would would then I'd stop, and then Marty would talk, and Marty was his college coach. He was an undefeated NCAA national champ four-time Greco U.S. champ, uh, world team member, coach of the Gophers for 17 and a half years. So, I mean, assistant coach, really good coach. And um, his dad, Marty Morgan's dad, has had over a 1,000 bare knuckle and catch matches. And their uncle, Red Bastone, is one of the old catch wrestlers. Yeah, so in that family, the Morgan family, they have two older brothers. One of them fought Marvin Hagler for a world title. The other one fought another world title. John Morgan was an NCAA Division II national champion and Olympian. Gordy Morgan was a D1 All-American and Greco Olympian. Marty Morgan was undefeated NCAA national champion and a, and a Division II national champion, for, you know, three-time All-American, four-time four U.S. Greco champion. <laughs> What's the oh, dinner table look like at that? Yeah, house? That's a tough house. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough house. So, you know, they, he has a very good mind for the game, and he's he's really uh, he breaks it down. And and Brock hears his voice. He's got a booming voice. So in the corner, if I say anything, I, I might yell, tell Bell, and then Marty goes, Roo! and it just bells out, and Brock really can hear his voice well. Yeah, I mean, he really looked like you guys were really calm in between. In between the rounds. I yeah, mean, I he's a, uh, you know, we. I told him about four weeks before the fight, I said, listen, you're going to get hit. Mark Hunt is going to hit you. So what? Big deal. Right? It's not, it's, he's a human being. All right? You just got to be ready for anything. So don't, don't let your jaw hang out there. And if your hand's down, you see that punch coming? I said, bring your shoulder to your ear. And you watch that one time. When Mark Hunt skips off his shoulder, he just lifts up like this, and his punch goes. Doo -doo. Nice. Get right off him. So, and the rest he's trying to. Which I was telling him to block with his elbows. So bring his elbows up and block and block and block and block. So bring that up and then come out. And so you'd see his hands going like this, like a robot. Ding ding ding. <laughs> he switch and leads and he come back. Ding ding ding. So it's good. So he he stuck to the game plan except for two leg kicks, which I go, wow, those are good leg kicks. And then Marty goes, stick to the game plan. <laughs> <laughs> Back <great>. on script. <laughs> yeah, that was great. He goes, hey, they were there. They were there, so I took them. How does he really feel, like, behind the scenes? Is he uh... – uh, he, he, feel, he felt great. I mean, he went in there after five years of being out of the game, you know, and just, you know, keeping busy and keeping in shape. And there, there's a, a, a number of times that I'd go up and – just work mitts with him and stuff. And, you know, just to keep him sharp, he, we had a little bit of a mini camp to see how he felt, to see if he was going to fight or the WWE was going to give him a big offer. And if they said if he wasn't going to, they weren't going to give him an offer, he would go back to the UFC. But the WWE came back with the offer. He couldn't refuse. So he said, okay. So he kind of ended that little mini training camp. And then he was busy with the WWE. And then, um, 
then he ca called me up and said, hey, I uh, just called Dana and said, I want to be on UFC 200. And they said, okay. Because I knew. <clears throat> he just said, yeah. And Dana was like, okay, who do you want to fight? He goes, whatever. Really? And we didn't care. Wow. Didn't care. Wow. Who. A couple of names came out and he said, I want to fight Mark Hunt. Everyone says I can't take a shot. I want to take Mark Hunt. Nice. What's, I said, okay. I really like the guy I saw. He uh, he seems real comfortable now. Before, he was the bad guy coming in. Everyone was talking about, there's a pro wrestler, he's not going to be able to do it. So he played the heel. And in, in WWE and professional wrestling, the heel makes more money. And it's just the way it is, because a lot of people want to see him get beat. <laughs> so coming in, everyone, I mean, you go into these press conferences and everyone's like, Go back to fake wrestling. Boom. You know, so he goes, okay, I'm the bad guy. I'm playing it. And Marty and I look at each other like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the best thing is? The funniest thing is, is after the mirror fight, you know, when he just went on that tire race, yeah. he's like frothing out of the mouth. His mouth guard's coming off. Literally. Cooler's light instead of Bud Light. All that just going nuts. And the crowd is booing. Boo, and all of a sudden he goes, and then when I'm done, I just might go and get on my wife. And everyone just goes, Aah! and he walked, he walked in the back and he just goes, all right, that was a good fight. We're done. <laughs> Another day at the office, right? Yeah. <laughs> no kidding, no and then, like, if you looked at any of those interviews, when they try to bring up the comments he made to, to uh, you know, in UFC 100, he just goes, come on, people, it's entertainment. <laughs> we had it all scripted. And then he laughs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, he's man. a good guy, really good guy. He's like you know, he's basically a, a he has a, a big farm in in Saskatchewan now. I mean, he farms up there, tinkering with tractors, taking in fields, raising his kids as farm kids, making them work hard every day. Said, I, "Hey, they're gonna they're gonna grow up just like I did. They're not gonna get hand me you know anything handed to them. They're gonna get their butt busted every day." How old is How old is Brock now? How old is he? He's, he's going to be thirty nine. Okay. Wow. That's stepping back in the ring at that age. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's impressive. Yep. Yeah, he's, he's thirty eight. He'll be thirty nine coming up. He's still in awesome shape. He's ripped. Yeah, this training camp was phenomenal in the fact that, and here's a big thing about the training, which a lot of people. I think Alan talked about a little bit about you have to think about not only the the pounding and a, doing a you know all that think about heavy bag tie pads focus mitts grappling wrestling everything is pounding on our joints mm. and so one of the big things is recuperative training getting your joints to expand and open up and all that stuff is so important and so you know we use a lot of different things like uh the hypersphere i don't know if i have one with me right now but uh I, I think I have it out there, but it's like a, you know, the, the balls you roll on, right? These vibrate like a high frequency and it just works your joints. So you lay on it and you roll it on your muscles and just like those, uh, the tubes that you use on your legs, yep. we got one the motor in it. So it's just, they vibrate like at a high level. It's like hypersphere so it's called. Hypersphere, yes. And it's one of the best. And I got introduced to that at this camp and Luke, Uh, our and uh, you froze up he, on us. You froze up on us a little bit there, Greg. Right when you said Luke, oh, okay. it, uh, the guy, the guy that introduced me to this stuff, his name is Luke, and he's the uh, a conditioning coach for the Denver Broncos, and he has just tons of exercises <laughs> to open up your joints to make sure that um, you know you're 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 giving your joints a break. You're not just yeah. pounding them. But you're opening them up, expanding them, and allowing them to, you know, get that full range of motion. And if you have something wrong with it, you got to take care of it. And it's not only the joint, but it's all the connected tissue around the joint. And before you start to do any major therapy, you got to break up all the scar tissue and all the soft tissue work it has to be done first, and then you build on that. And so, yeah, it was pretty cool. And I learned a lot in this camp. So, uh. How much of that did you do? Uh, so we'll just we'll just focus on that for a minute. We were going to talk about training fighters anyway. Might as well talk about this one. 
So how much of that did you focus on versus technique versus conditioning? Well, the, the beginning of the beginning of the, the camp every time was about at least thirty minutes of stretching and and warming up and doing all these you know quick feet drills and and you know little weight drills and planking and mm. the balls and the, the hypersphere and all the other stuff to break up all the tissue and get everything there and then you started doing uh, uh different core exercises uh, then then doing the fast feet drills and then starting the pummel so we'd work our way up just gradually work his way up so his body was ready to to really go and then we would start our regular like pummeling come out shadow box for 10 15 minutes moving around and then go back and work some technique and then live goes and then afterwards the process is reversed on kind of hypersphere stretching everything out back again getting massaged every day perfect it was just super important and so he was 100 percent healthy joints were great muscles were relaxed he's a pretty flexible guy pretty funny he's how flexible he is and and you know because he had almost broke his neck in professional wrestling you know just got super wrecked and so big part of his training is not only just the pounding but is the how do we recuperate and not much original pace because for him he's very in tune to his body and he will lose we had a couple practices where he sweat out 11 pounds in one practice 11 pounds unbelievable so you cannot rehydrate 11 pounds back for the next day so you can't have two full out workouts like that because you're going to get injured so if he had a training session where he'd lose that much weight he would try to rehydrate and the next day would be a drilling day mm. and then when he got back he said okay we're ready to go let's hammer it out so take me through a, a how long is fight camp how long is a camp for something like this uh generally we would hope to have you know more like an eight week camp or eight 12 weeks. week okay 12 weeks at, at the very end that's like a super long camp okay okay so what does so let's just say for the first four weeks do, does your fighter train five days a week six days a week? like how many days a week? Uh, you know at at first you know generally what i what i have all my guys they're always at about about a 50 percent the training so they're always ready maybe even at a 60 percent okay because you don't know you might get that phone call Okay. Hey, we need a fighter in two weeks. So if you're totally out of shape and not ready, you're done. You miss your opportunity. But if you're 60%, you can get it up to, you know, you can bump that up pretty fast, you know, because your body's already in the groove. You might not be at your total best because you didn't have a fight camp, but you're going to be able to go in there and be competitive. And if they need a short, you know, a short time fight, any recourse and they, I mean any uh, resources and they finally find somebody they even if they lose it's like they watch the fight like it never happened you know they say hey we're not going to count that as a loss you gave us a break we needed a fighter you were there so if a fighter has an opportunity like that and to get into a big show like the UFC it's it's silly not to take it unless you're totally out of shape so we always keep our guys in like a 60 percent at least you know, so they're drilling, they're sparring a little bit. They're, uh, you know, still rolling. Now they're now they're probably taking more classes, doing jujitsu class. They're doing Thai boxing class. They're, they're drilling specific things, or 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 during during glove drills, they're trying to do specific new skills to develop. And then once a fight camp comes in, now we're we're pretty ready. We have our base there, foundation. Now we kind of look at who the person's fighting, and then we make a, a general game plan, what we're going to do. I, and for me, I would how would I fight my fighter? If I was them, what would I do? So I look at his weaknesses. I watch what he does. I see where he needs some work, and I say, if I was fighting you, this would I do. Right? So we got to first take care of that. And then after that, they got to worry about your game plan. So what? So uh, take me through. Let's just say let's let's pare it down to one week. 
um, uh, how many times a day are they training more than one once a day? And so you, you mentioned classes. I, yeah. I've heard you talk about that before that you get irritated when you have you have fight practice, which how long is a fight practice? An hour or two hours? About an hour and a half. Okay, so you have fight practice and then you have classes where you're developing yeah. the skills and the Ooh. finesse and all of that. So I've heard you say before that you get irritated if fighters just think they only have to go to fight practice and they don't have to go to class. Yeah, so, it's silly because the bottom line is they're still learning. I mean, so, Sean Shirk is a product of the classroom. We had our fight training, but he would go to jujitsu class. He would go to Thai boxing class. He would go to whatever because he wanted to develop that skill and he knew if I'm going to be the best I can be, I have to isolate that area so if you wanted more you know kicking strike back or whatever he has to get to jujitsu class he did he, he he went to a lot of jujitsu classes and that's the way it, that's how he developed and i think it's very important because you get to work with just kind of regular people you bring yourself down to earth again because one of the other things I cannot stand is fighters that think they're something special because they fight. Any clown in the world can get in a cage and fight and lose. You know, <laughs> that doesn't make any difference. You know, what, what, to me, you're still just a student. In fact, and all my fighters pay like students. Nobody trains here for free. I love it. Yep. Because that's the way it is. And, I, and when I had a guy go, well, why do we have to pay? We do all these fights. And I go, how many students have you brought in because of your fights? <laughs> I go, if, if I knew that you were like a marketable guy that actually brought in students, I'd be like, hey, have at it. Let's do this. It's great. I said, but other than that, you don't. So the other thing is, are you done Are you uh, done learning? And they go, no. And I said, then that makes you a student. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I have fighters in class all the time, so I have no worries. That's great. So let's bring it back. It, I just want to hear a little bit more of the detail. Um, we're really lucky, you know, one of the best coaches on the planet with us. So let's bring it back to, uh, okay, so they're attending classes. This is your normal cycle, like the fighters on, on a regular basis are taking fight practice, uh, and they're taking classes um, if they're – listening uh to the coach um so now the call comes down uh you have a fight and you have time it's not a rush job it's time to prepare for the fight that's coming up what does one of those weeks look like so obviously the i know you have nutrition etc but let's just focus on how do you design a week in the life of that fighter uh what do we focus on well in, initially I just uh, have them uh, just increase their training a bit, right? We're gonna we're gonna add some mitt work like after the the grappling practice. So our live, like our pro practice every day is at eleven o'clock. Okay. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we focus one hundred percent on on MMA grappling. Okay. So we start we start on our feet and we you you strike take down and once you hit the ground it's live, and then we may focus on you know, going off the wall a little bit, like we're going to fight into the wall. Then once you touch the wall, it's live. All right. So once a person does that, it, they start to warm their body up. They're just doing a normal training like that. But now we're going to compound it right after they get done with that practice. They're either going to do rounds on the ground, ground dummy, or they're going to do focus mitts. At first, probably three rounds just to get nice and crisp, get their body worked up. But because the goal is, you want to have a gradual improvement and then a peak for your fight, because if you train too hard for too long, your body just wears out, and mm. you're just not any gas in your fight. How far out is the peak? The peak is probably. I mean, the goal is you want to be peaked about two weeks before that fight, because the last week is basically going to be dedicated towards just not being hurt, losing weight. That's it. I mean. We like we'll we'll go in and get a, a workout in, a roll, get a sweat, maybe some focus mitts, right? But now the whole goal of that last week is to 
give the body a big break. So now it's it's getting all it's it's rebuilding itself. It's getting healthy. It's you know it's just all the snaps coming back because it's not being worn out. And maybe the the morning of the the fight, we go in, we have a really good workout. We get a good sweat. We want to go until they get a to their they totally open their lungs, and then we go over strategy just to re revisit it and get it planted back in their head. But it's really important the day of the fight that they get their lungs 100% opened up and their blood is flowing. And then once we get in the back, it's, it's easy. Your bronchioles are open up fast and you can go, you'll be in shape. But if you don't do that, it's almost like you get kind of claustrophobic in that first round. It's a little fatigue. You're like, ah, and then finally your lungs open up and you can roll. You can get into it. Does that also good help in the morning? Does that also help with the, uh, the psyche? You know, to, to just, you've already kind of gotten into it for the day? Yep, yep. I mean, it's all about, because going over that game plan, and usually that day, because they've been pretty pretty well rested, their punches are just snapping and really crisp. They feel really, you know, they feel good, pretty strong. And then, uh, you know, it really does build up the mind. And even Brock alluded to this on one of his interviews and said, hey, it's, it is. It's a mental game. Because in the training camps, you doubt yourself. You, 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 do I really want to do this? I mean, he's, he goes, anybody who's, who's really realizing you're going to go in and potentially get really hurt, you got to think about it. And you're going to have this mind game. And the thing is, you got to beat that guy in, in your mind. You got you to win over that first. And so that's kind of why it's important also to progressively build up the fighter so he's feeling better and better. And my whole thing is – and we very rarely ever had to pull anybody out because of an injury in since 1993. That's amazing. We've had maybe, I remember James Cook busted his toe. Oh, Matt McIntyre lacerated his testicle. That was a bad one. All right, that's for another podcast. We'll have you back yep. for that one. <laughs> yeah. Think about this. This is how tough Matt is. <laughs> He got kneed in the balls, ruptured his testicle, kept training, got up the next morning and ran. He said every step was like he was getting snap kicked in the balls, came and did a heavy bag and said, man, I think something's wrong. Really? <laughs> and so he went to the hospital and they go, yeah, your ball is lacerated. And... If the surgery doesn't go as well as planned, you might have a Super Bowl in there or something. <laughs> and he's like, what? So, yeah, they had to sew it together. Unbelievable. And if anybody that knows Nat, ran, if anybody yeah, knows Nat, he's like Greg. Like, he's, he's like, what? Because <laughs> so, he had a fight coming up. He's like, man, I don't want to give this fight up. Another thing, another fight that Nat, Nat took, he had basically didn't train for 10 days before the fight because he had super – Super bad bronchitis. So he didn't train. We flew up to New York. The first day he trained was warming up for the fight in 10 days. And I, and I go, well, the first round, just get your, get your, open up your lungs, get your breath back, and then we'll start to go from there. And that's the one with the, the Egyptian magician when he uh, okay. low kicks and hits him in the eye and his mouthpiece flies out and he, <laughs> he busts his eye socket. So he did not train at all. Ten days without training because of bronchitis. And he said, I'm not pulling out of the fight. Bingo. So we've we've had very rare occasions where we had to pull out of a fight in all those years. And so it's important that when you're training a fighter that they're staying healthy throughout that camp, trying to release the injuries. Here's another one. Sean Shirk, before his fight with Kenny Florian, uh, it was probably 10 days, eight days before the fight, he shot in, one of the guys sprawled, and he tore a labrum in his shoulder. Tore full tear. And so he could not use that arm. Couldn't pummel, couldn't do anything. It was his right arm, too. And so he goes and gets a, he calls the UFC and says, hey, can I get a cortisone shot? Is that okay? And they said, yeah, that's fine. So he got a cortisone shot in it, 
and goes in and he fought Kenny Florian with a totally torn labrum. And if you watch that fight, you'll see that he's not hitting with his right hand a lot, which he used, which he usually does. He's doing all like left-handed hits. Four days later, he had after the fight, he had surgery. That that guy is so hardcore. Yeah. So you know, he he said, "There's no way. This is a title fight. There's no way I'm pulling out oh of this my thing." God, that's so, another. Look. I that's, can't imagine it. Yeah, the mental toughness and just knowing that no matter what, and he'd say, "Hey, once you the, once that bell rings." Adrenaline, endorphins, mask all that pain. I'll just fly through it. It's only yep. five rounds. Wow. So that was it. He did it. It's it's crazy sometimes what, what some of these guys can do. Uh, well, we we're following a uh, common theme this month on a lot of our podca- podcasts, and it's uh, workout design. And uh, the last one, we just talked about how we design our own workouts and, and just set up the overall – outline of a routine for maybe for yourself Mm -hmm. for me uh right now every day i start my day out with carenza Mm. i think that's one of the best things it's almost like tai chi because your your joints are moving in a nice fluid manner so i start out with double stick go to single stick with my left hand first and then i switch it to my right hand and i go stick and dagger stick and dagger on the other side and then that's it. I start. That's how I start my day, and uh, and I think that really opens up my joints because it's it's uh, not jarring. I don't do it like fast. I do it in a really smooth. I try to be as smooth as possible. And some days I use blades. Some days I just sticks. You know, whatever. But I, I just I try to have some fun with it and just move as try to be as smooth as possible. Mm-hmm. Right, and then. Then uh, for me, I you know usually make my little smoothie and get my body going, and then I go into um go into the gym, and then as I if I have my workout, then if it's an empty hand workout, I'll start out with shadow boxing, and again for me I'll start out really slow because I want to warm up my body, right? right? So I'm slowly moving and just finding where there's any kind of kinks, and even just take one arm and just move it, just get it going, and then snapping that punch, moving around, then start moving my knees my elbows and start to increase the intensity a little bit move around you know look at the mirror get now start to visualize somebody throwing punches at me moving around starting to get really active with it so i start to build my my shadow boxing up and i'm a i'm a big believer in shadow boxing i think it's a huge huge tool for developing skill developing your your imagination right because i really focus on visualization when i'm shadow boxing so I, I visualize if I hit somebody in the nose and their nose is bleeding, I'm going to retarget that nose. I'm going to fake it back to that nose. So I try to like fight somebody right in my shadow boxing. And every mm-hmm. once in a while, and if you if it happens, you got to milk it, you ought actually start getting like adrenaline going. I mean, whatever you did, whatever I visualized, got something cooking. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're like, whoop, 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 whoop. And I always say when you get to that point, you better milk it for everything it's worth because who knows when that's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so if i'm lucky enough to get that i'll really utilize that and then boom my body's really warmed up and then uh then I'll, I'll have a little bit of a bag work workout i'll come in and and for me i i focus on really simple combinations on the on the beginning mm-hmm. right i might just go like you know jab cross <clears throat> right kick jab right kick jab cross left kick and just move around get my body open very simple and then I'll start to move the bat. I'll, I'll hit, and then I'll move. Three punch combo, move. Three punch combo, move. So every time I hit, I move around the bag. You know, and that's that's tight, more tiring than you think because you're nonstop. You're always moving. And then I'll I'll come back and I'll go all in fighting now. So everything has to be my forehead has to be on the bag. Now I'm hitting elbows and doing forearms, doing like a panatukan in fighting. All that stuff is happening on the bag. I'm working my knees elbows forearm shots so i'm just like if i was in fighting what would i do and then i bring it back out and then i just like isolate elbow and knee elbow and knee and i just start try to think long knee and spike that knee in there and try to be very exact my goal is to see how many times i can hit that bag you know with that nice sharp knee the right. nice tip of my elbow. so i try to be really exact bags move around i like the teardrop bag for that because it feels really good when you're doing it and then um I get done with my bag work and 
I will then Carenza. So cool down a little right bit too. Back, I just Go back to it. Yeah, I just basically compacted my joints by hitting right. the bag. So now I got to open them up again. Right. I go right back to super smooth, slow Carenza. I do one hand and I'll switch it off. And I'll just keep switching arbitrarily. I don't have any kind of routine. I just switch when I'm going to switch. And I move around and I try to get into it. And just go. I don't know if this is true, but I've held pads. 20 since the 90 early 90s multiple times 40 minutes an hour and a half in a row guy after guy after guy my shoulders and my elbows are for the most part no problems and you've and been I, doing this all along it's just been your routine for yeah, a long yeah. time yep yep and, and for me i really do think that the carenza did something to keep my shoulders and elbows a little bit more flexible and loose mm -hmm. and open so that you know when i'm taking the impact you know the, the shoulders is healthier oh you just you used to that that's my theory i'm sticking to it well <laughs> you're living many, you're that, living proof of it sorry that's Alan. Think, you know because that's the only thing i can think that i have other holders that i talk to and they're like yeah my shoulders are wrecked i can't hold anymore my elbows are jacked i can't hold anymore and i'm like oh they're like, how can you, how are you holding for like Brock and all these guys? I go, I don't know. I mean, every once in a while, I might get a tweak, get to the stick, work it out. And I'm, and I'm really big into, you know, using the, all the other stuff of opening to my joints and getting all the, you know, expanding everything and working right. the muscle all the way, the entire muscle, not just where it hurts, but in front of it, behind it and back of it, break down all that tissue. And again, you know, this recently in the last, six weeks i've been working at hyper severe ball and uh just got to the tube every day and that thing is mint worth every cent nat like loves it he bought one right away i'll have to put that in the show notes because uh, i've never heard of it yeah it's awesome how, how many times a week do you normally do this routine um i i do the i do like my bag workout and stuff like that probably three times a week mm-hmm and like today, my day started. I came here. I did my I did my Carenza. Um, I did my Carenza. Everything was good. Came in. I taught wrestling class. So I started out with just shadow wrestling and uh, basically doing uh, what we call stance and motion drill, working with the guys. And we worked all front headlocks and techniques. So everything's nice and smooth, nothing crazy because we're working technique with the kids. And then... Um, then I had sparring class. So I got out. I always have a stick right around there. So I start out. I do a little Carenza first. Blah, 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 blah. Then I start shadow boxing. And I work my way up. Then I spar. Then I did uh, glove drills. Then I sparred today. So Nice. And then I got done sparring. I had to clean up the blood. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got someone kicked a scab off my elbow. That was bleeding. And then... um. And then it was a bloody nose, so it was a, it was a, it was a mess. But, you know, clean it up, and then uh, here we are. That reminds so, me of your rant at uh, the CSW camp when you were like, stop asking me if I'm okay. It's normal. It's like taking a piss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It really is. I mean, my God, we're, we're, we live in the life of the combative martial arts. We don't do, like, martial arts that aren't for fighting. <laughs> Everything. Collie. That that that's purpose is for fighting, all right? Hedgehogs <laughs> do that. Whatever you do, it, it the purpose is for fighting. Thai Truth. boxing, the purpose is fighting. <laughs> Jiu Jitsu, the purpose is fighting. It's not to you know, you can still do it, and that's that's kind of one of the reasons why I really like Thai boxing, is that you can kick, punch, knee, elbow, full out, and when you got a holder, nobody gets injured. But you can't right. do that in sparring. That's why this. The timing is so important. I think the timing sparring, and I tell the guys to be super creative when they're sparring. Try new things. Open up your mind. Don't try to make it like it's this is your fight. Don't act. Don't try to prove yourself in sparring. I see that all the time. A guy kind of if they don't fight, that's the only way to prove themselves is in sparring. And I I usually take care of that pretty fast. I just sick one of the mad dogs on them. <laughs> oh. I say, hey, this guy wants to fight. Give it to him. You get Volkman for this round. 
what happened? What happened? Did I say something? I go, no, you, you, you were hitting one of our girls like really hard. Are you, are you, are you daft? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is awesome because uh, last time we uh, talked about this, this is so great. We were talking more about the uh, the technical breakdown and you know training with purpose training using mm-hmm. round timers etc to keep you on schedule and keep the structure going but you went yeah. more into the mental the 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 visualization of it so it's it adds another layer on it so you've got these other systems that are automating it and keeping you on track uh, you know in the technical end for you know schedules and round timers and you've got your outline you know and after a certain point it's in your head what you want to do yeah but yeah. now now you're taking it to a much deeper level with visual visualization you get the adrenaline and it, like you were saying with alan now you're even building in improving your body opening your joints and staying healthier all of these things are happening at the same time that's so efficient this is yeah i mean i think it's super important super important that you know now especially obviously you know in my you know just 51 now what um, I remember, I remember Guru Dan saying, "One of these days you're going to be 50," and I'm like, "No, I'm not. I'm 22." Never happened. Yeah, never happened. You know, but he'd always say, "Yeah, things are going to change. At 40, things change. At 50, things change. And at 60, and gee, 70, you never know. You know, it's like unbelievable. <laughs> there I am. There you go. So now you're changing. You're, you're finding these new things out, and you find that it's super important. And I and I think back and I go. What if when I was starting this, I was into the recuperative part of the martial arts as much as I am now? Yeah. Who knows where he could have been? It's unbelievable. You know, and now, like with Gunner, he broke his arm in wrestling. So right now, I, you know, I talked to Luke, the guy that, and he said, yeah, let's do all soft tissue work first. Don't, have, don't let him do any kind of therapy yet. Tell the, tell the physical therapist, nope. We got to break up all the scar tissue, work all those muscles down, do all the soft tissue work first, because he said otherwise you're building on like a, a frayed, old rubber band, that's getting the things around are getting stronger. What's going to happen? It's going to start to pull apart again, and then all of a sudden, boom, you get a major injury. I said no, we got to break up all the tissue first. And he goes, that's why we can have a football player get full reconstructed knee surgery and be playing in next season. How do they break it up? Um, a lot of like, like a lot of pushing and just you know, a lot of deep massage, like really deep tissue massage. Right. Um, like on a hypersphere ball, when you're doing that, you're like you're putting all of your weight on there, so it gets really deep. It's like you're having your own personal Lionel with you. You know, <laughs> Lionel's a guy who does yeah. massage at CSW. For anybody who doesn't know that. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a miracle worker. Uh, it's not the most pleasant half hour <laughs> but afterwards man it's unbelievable everybody's it's been crushed by, by lionel <laughs> yeah so he's like okay if your shoulder hurts and you're on the hypersphere ball you find that place that really hurts you settle it in you just land you relax your breathing and get let it just get deeper deeper then start to rotate it find another spot that's a little bit sensitive mm. let the same thing happen and then and he goes and like like two minute rounds do that for like two minutes and then take a break two minutes take a break he has to do like six times and then i go on uh, like the trx type straps and then you're stretching your joints out and you're stretching up you're going up and down and putting body weight on there to open up your shoulders and he goes you don't want to get it to the point where it's where it's hurting just get it to the point where it's starting to get sore and then you're like okay you got to stretch that out a little bit now you're trying to find that place that you need to focus on and then it's just really taking the time, and that's huge. And I think so many people think that's a that they're wasting that time where I could be doing something better. Well, that's probably the best thing you can be doing. Completely agree. Yeah, <laughs> best thing you could be doing right there, it's and trying hour, to hour and a half a day of just that. Yeah, and trying to get the fighters who are young and twenty two like I was, <laughs> and trying to open up that door is sometimes kind of hard because they're like, yeah. I'm going, I'm feeling great. I remember just, it's like I never got tired, mm. you know? And even as I was hurt, I'm like, well, just work through it. And you did. Now that doesn't work anymore. 
comes back and but visits you. <laughs> that's what I tell the guys. I said, do you want to feel this for the rest of your life? Mm. Because if you keep training over that injury, you will feel it for the rest of your life. I said, forget that nonsense. You know, be smart. Be well, smart. You touched on something, too, uh, talking about, you know, feel this and then go to another spot and let it sink in. I did a, a couple of training sessions with Alan when we were out at CSW. We'd go to the, the gym in the morning and even lifting weights, uh, he would do that. We were on some cables and it, you know, everybody's used to just doing your reps, but literally he had me stop at certain points and really focus on the muscle group you're working and just put your mind there. And then you, you really could feel it. You could, you start oh, moving yeah. little things around and then just little, I mean, you don't even need much weight, uh, at all to make that work and you you just described the exact same thing with the uh hypersphere like really take your time and focus and, and put your mind in that spot that's just such a high level um that if you can get the young guys to do that wow really be ahead of well, the game they've even proven that if, even if you focus on one area of your body your nerves will start to stimulate down there Ooh. and your blood flow goes through you don't even have to do anything except for deep focus on that area. And I remember, remember Zen in the martial arts? Oh, yeah. Well, yep. You know, remember the guy got injured and he, and he visualized a little workman working on his knee, whatever, and filing it and smoothing it and oiling up the joints, having these little workmen inside his knee? I would do that all the time if I have an injury. I visualize the little workman on my knee working. And what's that doing? It's bringing the blood to that part of the right. knee. It's focusing. It's breaking up. I'm a huge believer in that. I mean, I really learned it, visualization as a gymnast. And then uh, I brought it to the rest of my rest of the, my sports and martial arts after that. But at, at first, I was kind of like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Think about my move. What's that going to do? <laughs> That's kind of stupid. Why don't I just do it? <laughs> and my coach said, because every time you're doing it, you're crashing right now. It's not working. So I want you to go home through the week. And I remember him saying, as much as your adolescent brain can handle, <laughs> he said, focus on this for as long as you can. Try to think about your body doing the move perfectly. And if you can't see your own body do it, put your face on someone else's body that you've seen do it. Oh, I haven't heard that one. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and just watch it, watch it do it. And pretty soon you're going to be able to see yourself do it. And what it was was a release move off a high bar. So you're going up over the bar, re-grabbing the bar, and I was just crashing. I missed my grip, or I bounce off the bar. I mean, it was it was bad. And so I said, "Okay, I'll do it. I'll do whatever." So before bed, or when I'm hanging out bored after playing like Atari Pong, <laughs> <laughs> that was our video game. <laughs> I, I would. I would, I would go, okay, I'm just going to focus on my move. And I would sit down and I'd really try to do it. And I, and I gave it everything I had for that brain power that I had at that point. And I came back and the first thing I did, I got up and I did a few giants, warmed up my body. And all of a sudden it goes, okay, it's, let's work your release move. Let's go. And I went, whoom. And I hit it. I grabbed the bar perfectly. And I just let go and went, ah. And he goes, why'd you let go? And I go, because I've never been there before. That was, was kind of scary. <laughs> and after that, I hit it, I grabbed the bar, and I never missed it again. It was just like that. I learned it over the weekend by not doing it. And so at that point in time, I, I realized I go, that stuff is real. It works. So that was in 11th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade. And so I started focusing on my wrestling like that, seeing myself take down guys, sprawling when they're attacking me. You know, I started visualizing on everything I was doing. I gotta, That's, I gotta throw a uh, uh, something in there that I've, <laughs> I've, I've known you for a really long time at this point, and we did the the clinch videos of what, what was that like two thousand, a long yeah. time ago. Um, just the other day in one of my training sessions, uh, grappling uh, with my training partner, stuff that I've learned from you and Eric. Uh, I don't, it's so weird. Like just, I don't know if it's getting older or putting your mind in things. Stuff's coming out now that I saw you guys do <laughs> 15 years ago 
it's so weird how that works and literally at this point because i'm not far behind you uh in age and uh it, the, the sensitivity that's coming out now because my body obviously can't back it up um is amazing like i'm feeling things and and if anybody watches greg nelson teach um he's he's on a whole bunch of our videos he's got a bunch of his own videos just watch the concentration he, half the time he'll close his eyes and you can see it like you can see eric does this too you can you watch the high level guys there's this level of focus there and this sensitivity once they get a hold of you you're really going to have a problem because there's so many little variations going on uh, of this uh, and it's exactly what you just said it's, it's the same thing this you're putting your mind there um you did one uh where you were in side control and you're holding the guy down with a point on your rib and you have your two feet uh posted out on the side i did that the other day i i, I did a little variation and showed that to my training partner and i said so watch this i've got you in, in keza so watch this. I, I got this from Greg. Watch, watch this. He just this. He literally, it's like a point on the rib, and it was the weirdest thing. He was like, oh, like you literally, just a little. You didn't even see any kind of a shift. It's just putting everything on that one little point. And I would have called it crap if I'd seen it. Yeah. But if you feel it, it's the same thing. So it really blows my mind. Some of the stuff you guys and it. it I guess I'm a little bit dense because it only took me about 15 years to start realizing it. <laughs> well, you know. It's funny because the it, same thing happens with all of us. But, you know, that's why I thought it was so awesome to have Francis, Stephen Francis at the CSW camp. He blew people's mind away. <laughs> yeah. Standing in the stance that you look at it and go, I'm going to blast right through this guy with a double leg. And that one wrestler <laughs> guy goes, and he just goes, Wah! just basically <laughs> drops his hand, the guy's face <laughs> into the mat. And the guy's like, what just happened to you? <laughs> How can this happen? And then how rooted he is, and it's it, it was so awesome, you know. It, I thought it was great. And then when he, you know, how he gets, he's like, okay, like this, and he puts his hands on you and he starts demonstrating on you. You're like going, oh my God, I'm getting ragdolled by this dude. Yeah, it, it's so cool. Don't know what has happened until like five minutes later. You know, somebody's like, he just did this to you. <laughs> I kind of get that feeling with Greg and Eric too. <laughs> It's the same thing. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing all that with us, Greg. I, we're, we're coming up on the uh, on the hour. So I really appreciate your time. People, you could pretty much do a Google search uh, for Greg Nelson. <laughs> yeah, Google. Uh, yeah, and you're going to get loads of information. Um, I, I did the same thing this morning, just preparing for this podcast. And uh, I've known Greg for a while, and. Uh, just wanted to get online and, you know, uh, brush up before we did this. And it's amazing the amount of information is on there uh, and what you will find. We'll save this for some future podcasts, but uh, there's many more stories uh, in this individual's uh, past. Uh, truly one of the best martial artists in the world. Uh, honestly, I don't think anybody would argue that. Uh, you know, the, the, the list is really too long to go into right now uh but and i if you don't know by now just listening to him talk here a really down-to-earth person uh very approachable because you would think you know somebody at this level sometimes you think well, i can't talk to him it's not approachable this is one of the nicest guy i remember back in the day because i was one of them everybody was scared to death of greg nelson um <laughs> i was hey, that was not john chai's fault <laughs> <laughs> everybody was scared of him too <laughs> he made he made me the hench guy so i never passed anybody he wouldn't let me pass anybody he said <laughs> knock him out make sure he don't pass and now it's your test what if you don't do it <laughs> awesome thank you so much coach greg yes it was awesome we'll have to do it again we'll have to do a big roundup with with uh sensei eric and the whole group that'll be a blast all right let's oh. do it i'll make some plans 